Good evening, and welcome to 2020. My partner, John Miller, is on assignment. Tonight, we invite you to share some laughs and some tears with one of the great women in entertainment, Carol Burnett. A generation ago, she ruled Saturday Night Television with her uproarious variety show. And last November, 30 million viewers, including many too young to have been original fans, tuned in for her Network reunion special. More viewers than watched the season finale of ER or The West Wing. There is no doubt about it. Carol Burnett is still one of the most beloved entertainers in America. And now she has added successful playwright to her list of accomplishments, but her life hasn't always been easy. And recently, she suffered a loss no parent should have to bear, the death of her eldest daughter, Carrie. Tonight, she talks openly and lovingly about that for the first time. But let's begin with the joy and wit of the hilarious Carol Burnett. <laughs> Television City in Hollywood. It's the Carol Burnett Show. America had a date with Carol Burnett every Saturday night for over a decade. Welcome to our, our first show that we're doing. I'm really excited. It must have been a wonderful time. When you look back, was it? Absolutely. I knew I was um, very fortunate the whole 11 years. Her variety show is a combination of sight gags. We'll throw away the past. Pure ridiculousness. Baby, baby innocent silliness. How come you never made it in talking pictures? I don't know. And the most fun was when everyone on stage couldn't keep a straight face. When he gets here, <laughs> I'm going to tell him what you've been doing. <laughs> the regulars on the show were Harvey Corman, Vicki Lawrence. I shot my father in the head 17 times by accident. And Tim Conway. like situations where she would have to control herself. The audience was screaming and Carol would have to control herself. And that made the audience laugh all the more. Carol's recurring characters became classics. Oh, come on, you dastard! Eunice. I can sharpen your pencil. The secretary, Mrs. Wiggin. <laughs> the cleaning lady. Did you have a favorite sketch or a favorite character? I loved doing the movie takeoff. Yeah. Because that was my background, seeing eight movies a week with my grandmother when I was growing up. So that was exciting. I got to be Lana Turner. Wasn't that wonderful? Not even close. I got to be Joan Crawford. I don't need a brick to fall on my head. <laughs> I got to be Vivian Lee. Sister, help me take these down. Well, what's she doing that for? Never you mind. Now the parody of Gone with the Wind became a classic. Because yes, I've got me a dress to make. Yes, sir. Did you know how hilarious it was? Yes, I did. And I said, this is probably the greatest side gag I've ever seen. Is Miss Starlet at home? <laughs> when you walked down the stairs... Oh, it was hard to... With that face, mm. that face, that straight face. Mm -hmm. You know how you try not yeah, to smile? Yeah, that's what I wanted. What? You, <laughs> no, you bite your teeth on your gums in here, you know? I was, I was doing that, I think, to keep from going. Uh, and there's that wonderful line... The gown is gorgeous. <laughs> I saw it in the window and I just couldn't resist it. When the Carol Burnett Show went off the air in 1979, it had won 22 Emmys, and Carol Burnett was the queen of television comedy. I'm so glad we had this time together just to have a laugh 
or sing a song. This song became Carol's signature ending to the show, and she always added a private message to her grandmother. Comes a time we have to say so long. Good night. Thank you. The pulling of your ear. That was for Nanny. That was, and how did that happen? When I got my first job, I called her, collect, and I said, Nanny, I'm going to be on television tomorrow morning, and it was live. And she said, well, say hello to me. And I said, I can't, I can't do that. I know they, NBC won't let me do that. But I said, Nanny, I'll pull my ear for you. And that means, hello, I love you. Later on, it was, hello, I love you. Your check's on the way. <laughs> After her weekly show went off the air, Carol, the comedian, reinvented herself as a dramatic actress. We don't need them to give him a medal for dying. In the TV movie Friendly Fire, she played the mother of a soldier killed in Vietnam. My is here. And she performed with opera singer Beverly Sills in Sills and Burnett at the Met. They became lifelong friends. The musicality of a woman is incredible. Her talent is, is astonishing because it's so multifaceted. There really is nothing she cannot do. stage, Carol's life was great fun, but in private she was facing serious problems. Her 21-year marriage to her producer, Joe Hamilton, was in trouble, and Carol discovered that her eldest daughter, Carrie, had become heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol. Carrie was 13 years old. How serious was the problem? Then? It was serious. It was alcohol and drugs. Alcohol started it and uh, drugs. Carrie was said to be smoking an ounce of marijuana a day, and she was already smoking cigarettes, a habit she would keep into her 30s. Did you blame yourself when she was on the drugs? Yes, yeah. uh, I did, because I thought, was, is, was there something I should have seen, something I should have known, something I should have spotted? You know, what did I miss? What was I not? strong enough, you know, all of that. You knew Carrie. What was she like, especially during the years of the drugs? Rebellious, underneath it, of, of wonderful sweetness. Carrie said to me, you know, it's not easy being Carol Burnett's daughter. My impression was that Carrie would have been just as happy if Carol had not been, in fact, much happier if Carol had not been a famous star. Carol herself was no stranger to addiction. Both of her parents had been alcoholics. With Carol's help, her daughter Carrie waged a four-year battle against addiction. She was very young, and I think it's better the younger you are, you can get them off it, you know. And she, she really decided she wanted to live. We got her to a program. So when she got clean and stayed clean, she was 17. When Carrie was okay after rehab. You and she went public. Yeah. And talked about yes to help others. Well, we also, I also did it selfishly because I knew the tabloids were going to go after it. And I thought, Kara, I talked to Kara, I said, honey, we, we've got to talk about it before anybody else because we know the truth. The once rebellious Carrie agreed. It was a turning point in their relationship. Mother and daughter went on a mission. The story of their ordeal made the cover of People magazine, and Carrie spoke out on the Donna Shore show. And then I said, well, I smoke pot now, but I'll never take pills. And I started taking pills, and I said I'd never do coke, and I started doing coke, and I'll never do this, never do that. That's cocaine. Yeah. Cocaine. Yeah. And there was a moment when Carrie's life turned around, and I, I think she became an adult. She took stock of herself and said, you know, it really isn't such an awful thing to have Carol as a mother. Your grandmother and your mother told you all their problems. You determined you were going to be a different kind of a mother. Right, and I think that could have been a big mistake. What did you do? I became Loretta Young. I became, uh, like, everything was perfect. 
There never was, I don't think the kids ever saw me cry. Yeah. They never heard, saw me get mad when they were growing up. You know, Nanny and Mama were always screaming at each other, which wasn't that terrific. I've since learned that uh, you can be all kinds of things yeah. and you just can't fight that. And, we, and you can't, I, I've decided I'm not gonna take the credit for anything any of my girls do and I'm not gonna take the blame, you know. Just remember that I'm your baby. Like Carol, Carrie grew up to be an actress, but she definitely didn't follow in her mother's footsteps. Carrie sang rock and roll in the Broadway show Rent. Pardon me, is everybody there? Because if everybody's there, I want to... Carol did Sondheim. <laughs> While Carol was the high-strung mother on Mad About You, I'm thinking about the school here, Mr. D. These Carrie are... played a struggling young performer on the TV series Fame. Carol was the graceful Grand Marshal in the Rose Bowl Parade. Whoa! Carrie was the wild child singer in the film Tokyo Pop. Mom and daughter were leading very different lives until Carrie suggested that they collaborate on a project based on the book Carol had written about her own childhood. Why did she want to do it? She read the memoir a few times and uh, she called me up and she said, Mom, why don't we just, for fun, I think this could be a play. Please welcome Carol and Carrie. I remember when you and Carrie came in the view yes. together um, and talked about the play. Carrie, what did you get from this that, um, that, well, the, that the influenced you, changed you? Well, the incredible gift of somebody writing their story for their kids uh, because I only know mom as an adult, not as a little girl. Uh, I look at you, my dear. Are you deliberately trying to be very different from your mom? <laughs> I, I grew up watching her, you know, walk, walk around with dresses with, you know, <laughs> with uh, curtain rod poles and funny wigs and big shoes. And I don't think the fruit fell too far from the tree to tell you that. <laughs> the rebelliousness of Carrie's teenage years was gone. Carol had developed new respect for her daughter as a writer. They were working as equals on a subject close to their hearts. But mother and daughter had no idea how important the play would become in their lives. Like many mothers, Carol Burnett lived through tough times with her then teenage daughter, Carrie. But Carrie's long, hard battle with alcohol and drug addiction would ultimately bring them closer together both personally and professionally. As we continue, you'll hear about their exciting mother-daughter collaboration. Together, they wrote a play, which opened this past April. It is Carol Burnett's bittersweet childhood come to life on the stage. Sometimes, well, Carol, you can go home like again, room, I remember, but bigger. <laughs> My recent <laughs> conversation with Carol Burnett took place at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. Carol was there for the closing week of Hollywood Arms, the play written by Carol and her eldest daughter. The set is based on the tiny one-room apartment where Carol lived with her eccentric grandmother, portrayed by Linda Lavin. Did someone get the lights in here? You'll find your The little girl played the young Carol Burnett. <laughs> Carol's real parents had divorced, and both were alcoholics. You were going to be our meal ticket. Carol's mother was emotionally unstable. She was a lost soul. She was drinking while you were growing up? Yes. I was about 11 when she started. When you lived with Nanny all those years as a little girl, Nanny was a hypochondriac, mm -hmm. um, no money, because right. Mama lived down the hall. Yeah. Describe what the life was like. I mean, it sounds awful, but I, it wasn't. Uh, I knew I was loved. There was a lot of humor. My mother was very witty and beautiful, and Nanny was funny as hell, and everybody was poor. We'd never get home. We would go to see a movie, and before we would leave, we would hit every stall in the, in the theater and put the toilet paper in her purse. So a good movie, you'd get a month's we'd supply get a, of yeah, we'd get a, yeah, and yeah. so, you know, it saved money. This is, this is 102, this is uh, the room. Last year, while working on the play, yeah, the Carol rented her old apartment in a rundown Hollywood neighborhood and fixed it up. Uh, 
We didn't have a shower curtain uh, because I hung all my clothes on the uh, shower rod because Nanny had all the closets filled up with junk and stuff, you know. And uh, so I took baths all the time. I loved to take baths. It was a place to come and be alone and fantasize and so forth. And so my clothes <laughs> were always just a little bit damp. Sometimes Mama would sit down on the toilet and she'd open this. This had an... Uh, and she'd sing into the air shaft because her voice sounded so pretty and she could hear the echo. And she'd sing, I'll get by as long as I have you. <laughs> Which would be great. You named your middle daughter Jody. Yes. After your father. After my father. Yeah. Tell me about Jody, your father. He was a drunk Jimmy Stewart. Now you rest for a minute. And I'll whip up some coffee for you. Cause he uh, was probably one of the sweetest human beings that ever lived. And uh, when he drank, he, he got even sweeter, if that was possible. He was just a very hopeless alcoholic. Did you love him a lot? Very much. Very much. He um, went on the wagon for a year. Can I come stay with you again this Saturday? Of course you can. And so for a year, I would go visit every weekend. I had some of the greatest weekends of my life with him and fun and talking. And you just keep praying for me like you do, and I'll never take another drop. I do, Daddy. I pray for you all the time. You see? It works. And then he started to drink. And you were furious. Oh, was I? Yes. In that sense, he broke your heart. Yeah. I figured... It was my fault I didn't pray hard enough, you know, but I know he didn't mean that, but that was the thing that uh, hurt, you know. Everything happened in, that's in the play. Broadway uh, legend uh, Hal Prince Albert directed Albert Hollywood Albert. Arms. It is not a dysfunctional family show. It's about somebody who came out of all that turmoil, a difficult fa childhood, and emerged triumphantly and about the love she feels about all those people who were party to the turmoil. It seemed to you like a normal childhood, but looking back, you do know it was pretty wacky. Yeah, oh yeah. I'm not yeah. saying it was normal that way. <laughs> you yeah. Know. Oh yeah, sure it was wacky. It could have destroyed you. It didn't. I, honest to God, Barbara, I never felt uh, deprived. And I had a goal. I don't know, what, at the time, I wanted to be a writer. And, um, you were going to be a journalist. A journalist. I was going to be an actress. <laughs> That's right. Now we talked about that. Why don't, we, why don't you just take my question? <laughs> Let me ask you about your grandmother now. <laughs> <laughs> Not as interesting as yours, I'm afraid. But you did get out of that situation. You did go to college. There's a bizarre story. Mm -hmm. You've gotten unexpected money. Yeah. Carol had wanted to attend UCLA, but the family was barely getting by on welfare. Besides, her grandmother saw no value in a college education. $42 was a bit too much for, you know, that was the tuition then. And uh, we had this little pigeonhole mailbox in the lobby, and I saw a letter in our mailbox. So I threw on my little robe and went out and got it. I opened it up, and out came a $50 bill. No note, no nothing. And I swear to this day, I don't know who put that in there because we didn't have it and if nanny had scraped it up or something she said look what i'm doing for yeah, you you know yeah, yeah. pennies from heaven that's a good fairy <laughs> at the ucla drama department carol learned that she was a natural comic she dropped out in her senior year and announced she was going to new york the first time i saw carol burnett's big break in show business came in the summer of 1957 in the form of a misguided love song on The Ed Sullivan Show. I made a fool of myself over John Foster Dulles. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles was a decidedly unromantic figure. Where did you ever come up with that idea? That idea was written, uh, the song was written by Ken Welch. And so Ken said, what if you were this young girl who went nuts over John Foster Dulles and I thought that was hysterical because he was his door. Yeah, he was the last person to go nuts over. Last person anybody yeah. would go nuts over. While Carol was pursuing her career in New York, both of her parents passed away. 
Carol went on to rapid successes. She was a regular on one of the most popular shows of the era, The Gary Moore Show. <laughs> it was during this time that Carol started signaling her grandmother, a gesture she continued through the years as her success grew. After Nanny passed away, the gesture became a tribute. The Carol Burnett show was an instant success. How do, how do you get to the ladies' room? You have to go? <laughs> Part of Carol's appeal was in her ability to make the audience feel that they were her extended family. It was really a family effort. Your, your husband produced it. Mm -hmm. The three little girls came to every, uh, every dress, dress rehearsal. rehearsal. Yeah. Her three daughters, Carrie, Jody, and Erin, practically grew up on the set, watching the taping every Friday night from the wings. All three went into show business. Carrie and Erin became entertainers. Jody co-produced her mother's recent special, Showstoppers. Carol's long marriage to producer Joe Hamilton ended in divorce. She remained single for the next 18 years until last fall when she took the plunge again with musician Brian Miller. Why tie the knot now? Why not? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's 23 years younger than mm -hmm. you. Yeah. You know, if this were a man, people would say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, I say, you know. that's my view. I mean, I think, well, look at our friends, yeah. Clint Eastwood, and look yeah, at our friends. Yeah, they marry young if women, everybody says fun. If it's good enough for the fellas, it's good enough for the girls. Okay. <laughs> Your grandmother, a nanny, also uh, married younger men, dated mm -hmm. younger men. You think there's a pattern here? There could be. Mm -hmm. There could be. Think she's looking down and saying, I did it's it? Sisters, you... just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> what has this marriage given you? Uh, a sense of security mm -hmm. and, and uh, feeling cared for and um, like I'm number one. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's the happy part mm -hmm. of your life. At the end of last summer, things were going well for Carol. She was happily married. Work on the play was proceeding smoothly. Then she received a phone call from Carrie that would change their lives. When 2020 returns. Can you tell us anything about the last days or your last words? She suffered. She suffered a whole lot. And uh, at one point, I, I was praying for her to be released. Next. continues. Once again, Barbara Walters. In the fall of last year, life was looking good for Carol Burnett. Her television special had been a smashing success, and casting was underway for the play Hollywood Arms, which Carol had co-written with her daughter Carrie. They thought it would be the first of many projects together. But then came the phone call from Carrie that changed everything. She said that uh, they'd found a lump on her, uh, in her lung, a mass in her lung. And so it was lung cancer. Right Carrie was admitted to Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles to begin treatment. Did it progress very rapidly? She had licked quite a bit of it with the first, um, first treatment of chemotherapy and radiation. But four months later, Carol heard heartbreaking news. The lung cancer had spread to Carrie's brain. She was fighting a losing battle. How you doing? It comes and goes. It comes and goes, and uh, it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's the hardest thing anybody can go through, I think. You had become very close to Carrie, hadn't mm -hmm. you, over these past years? Very, very close. She, uh, we really, we bonded uh, a long time before, but then of course writing the play together did that. And then when she was ill, you know, uh, in the hospital and uh, going and being together. Uh, Carrie never gave up. Carrie had a spirit about her uh, all through her treatments and everything of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this. We made tapes, videotapes of the auditions. Carol took them back to Cedar sinai on video, put them in the machine. Carrie saw 
every single member of this cast and sent back a very enthusiastic report. Carrie from what was her deathbed assisted in the casting. Oh, sure. Absolutely. It would be very hard to believe that Carrie accept, could accept dying. Carol and her daughter began the emotional roller coaster ride familiar to cancer patients. Hope for a miracle, followed by the harsh reality of the disease. There were those ups and downs. There were, yeah, yeah. and there were quite a few ups. Yeah, I, mean, I know. I remember thinking she, she was going to make some of the doctors. Uh, to, you know, at one point they totally given up, and then she all of a sudden started to rally and come back and walk again. And she named the tumor. She, she and so that she could talk to it she called it yucky chucky and she had a picture of it and she would visualize it, it and getting smaller and by the time she'd finished her first run of treatments it was like that big and it had been that big and the treatments had done that and plus her you know positive attitude and all and everybody was amazed humor got you through so much of your life and so much of your childhood. Did humor get you both through this? One night, she'd gone home, she'd been okay, and then she had a, like a backslide and had to go back into the hospital. I think it was around four or five o'clock in the morning. And she woke up and I said, hey, mom, you know. <laughs> I said, so you had to come back to the hospital, huh? And she said, I miss the food. <laughs> And then we both started to <laughs> howl, you know. She, she, she kept, and everybody on the floor, all the nurses were just in love with her, and the doctors were crazy about her. I don't know whether you want to share them with us, but can you tell us anything about the last days or your last words? Well... She suffered. She suffered a whole lot. And uh, at one point, I, I was praying for her to be released. Mm. You know, it was just too much. And she, uh, so, you know, we talked about it. And then, then she kind of slipped out of it, you know, for two or three days. Uh, she did apologize. Oh, for what, Cal? for smoking. Oh, my dear. She apologized to you for her smoking. Oh, I hope everyone who smokes can... She yeah. did. She said, Mama, if I could take it back, you know. Yeah. Carrie Hamilton passed away on January 20th, 2002. She was 38 years old. Her play opened to positive reviews in Chicago three months later. She wanted to come here so badly, you know, to be here in Chicago for it. And uh, she was just, even if I'm not doing too well, stick me on a train or something. <laughs> she wanted to be here. But I, I felt her here. Do you feel that this play is a, a tribute to Carrie? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, this is why I'm, I'm hoping that it will go forward. Uh, it is uh, her legacy, or one of them, you know, and uh, it's all her doing. How did Carol cope with all this? After Carrie died, uh, I had one meal with her, just the two of us, and I kept saying, you have to be grateful for the years you had. Uh, and not for the years you didn't. And uh, she'll never be out of your life, and there's no need for her to be out of your life. You just have to find a nice little niche for her so that you can always reach into the niche mm -hmm. when you want to communicate with her. When Brian and I were on the plane flying back for the first rehearsal in March, uh, I closed my eyes and I said, Carrie, give me a sign. Let me know you're going to be with me. That's all I said, you know. <laughs> So we checked into the hotel here, and there was a huge floral arrangement of birds of paradise. That was not only Carrie's favorite flower, but it was what she had tattooed on her shoulder. It was bird of paradise. 
Then the next night, we went out to dinner uh, here in Chicago, nice, lovely restaurant, and the maitre d' came up and said, I'd like to offer you some champagne, and this is a very special label to us. And he showed the label, and the label said, Louise. Now, that's Carrie's middle name, and it's the name of my mother. Oh, okay. And I thought, Carrie, you're not subtle at all. <laughs> This was just, you know, I really, we got goosebumps. And I never, the whole time we were here working on the play, I never felt um, alone. I'd sit down at the computer to do my homework or whatever Hal had discussed with me. And I really felt that she was in me, you know, doing this. Parents who have lost a child are probably never quite the same again, are they? I don't think so. I don't. I've gotten such beautiful letters from people. I mean, hundreds. And people who uh, have been there and are still coping. Carol has been through so much over the years. Alcoholic parents, a child who's addicted to drugs, divorce, and now the death of her eldest child. Where does she find the strength to deal with all of this? What's her choice? Either you give in to tragedy or you learn to live with it. She'll rise above it. She won't get over it ever because you don't. And, uh, but as she rose above the other tragedies, she'll have to, she'll have to, Barbara. She'll just have to get over this one. It's a, it's a terrible task, but she's up to it. You used to pull on your ear for Nanny's <laughs> message. Do you do it now for Karen? Oh, you bet. <laughs> I am glad we had this time together Cause it makes me feel like I belong Seems we just get started And before you know The play Hollywood Arms, produced by Harold Prince, is coming to Broadway this fall. And Carol, I'm so glad we had this time together. We'll be right back.